All right, session 83, which is kind of a sad special episode. Um, a couple hours ago, I found out that uh, my brother David died suddenly and was going to cancel for tonight, but then decided instead that I'd, I'd, I'd just memorialize him here. Um, some other business quickly. Um, because of holiday travel and stuff, we probably won't have brand new episodes for the next couple weeks. However, we have about a dozen shows from earlier in the history of the show that just never got edited and posted. And we'll try to put out a couple of those vintage ones from like a year and a half ago. All right, so anyway, um, my brother David died. and he, he was a hell of a guy. Be he, before he, you say how he died, or what he died, that he died, I, I think it's really important to say how he died, and uh, he was in phenomenal physical shape. He was a healthy guy. He was, yeah. he was just out of the Marines. He'd so, been in the Marines more than 30 years. Right. So the Marine uh, Reserves and then some active duty. Well, I mean, that's his story, but all we're saying is that it was probably just an overdose of some... Uh, well, you know what? We can't even talk about that, but he was, he was found in bed. It was just an act. We it it was not. It, it was just and an there, act. There's no coroner's report or anything at all yet. But uh, people are always curious why a healthy guy would would die. So we should say that you know it, it was just an accident. He he may have been having some trouble sleeping, and he may have. Um, I don't know. There, you know, taken some pills that didn't react properly with him but there's there's no coroner's report yet there's you know and and, and he he was a strict jew and, uh, and uh, i mean an observant jew is what it's called i call it orthodox and um you're not supposed to do an autopsy but they may still do an autopsy and um but so i don't know what we'll ever find out but he was uh, anyway let to, to begin more at the beginning um, you can't talk about my brother without talking about the 70s, which were, if you missed the 70s, you missed a lot of fun and you also missed a certain kind of hell. If you were a child of the 70s, the adults of the 70s were having a hell load of fun. It was the disco era, it was the quaalude era, it was the coke and, and super drinky era. And... Uh, things were a lot looser. It was before just say the just say no Reagan era. It was before our fucked up 21st century where things have seemed pretty dire for the past nearly 20 years. Um, the country was, you know, after Watergate and Vietnam, the country was ready to uh, cut loose a little bit and, and enjoy, you know, Everybody was, who was old enough and hot enough to have sex was having sex. Anyway, I have um, four siblings or ex-siblings, and none of, basically none of us has the same two parents. You know, my dad was married three times, my stepmom married three times, uh, my mom married a couple times. Um, it was a very loose era. And my brother, who was a fantastically fun guy, um, and who, he, I, but he, I, even though he was a fun guy and a, and a pretty wild kid, because I had two families. One was conservative and, and in Boulder, and then my other family with my dad and my stepmom in Albuquerque um, was a little wilder. And my brother down in Albuquerque decided he needed more in right around, I don't know, eighth, ninth grade, he decided he needed more structure in his life, so he asked to be sent to military school, which is frickin' crazy. He, he, got, he got himself sent to New Mexico Military Institute, NIMI, down in Roswell, New Mexico, which, which is, from everything I've heard, hellish. It's, uh, it, it, it's a rare kid who wants to be sent there. My, my, my stepdad and his brother were sent there because their mom just didn't want to deal. 
I mean, it was mostly kids. There were a lot of kids there who got sent there because they were discipline problems or because they had parents who didn't want to have kids around so much. Um, my my stepdad and his brother, they weren't discipline problems. It was more of them, their mom who was just, anyway, it, 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 it's, it's kind of a hellacious, sun-baked, high desert, but brutally punitive, tough-ass place to go. And my brother asked to be sent there. Um, then, I don't know, he lasted a year or two and then was like, all right, this is, this is brutal. Like he had a roommate who, who didn't wash enough and like my brother had to open his roommate's locker for inspection and the stench of, um, of the roommate's unwashed clothes made him barf. Um, um, then he went back to public high school for a year or two um, and was like, nope, back to military school. And uh, uh, what do you think of the 70s? You, you lived through it as a child of the 70s. I just, compared with today, I, I am telling young people that it was a much freer time. Uh, you think that in America that we'd be getting more and more advanced, but I think people were more free back then. I think people were free to speak their mind. People were more easygoing. Uh, the the gender the sexes liked each other better um, things were less fraught well I mean okay and uh, and also um, you said that if you were attractive enough you could have sex but actually you didn't have to be that attractive <laughs> it was it was a time when it was pretty easy for people to have sex with one another um, so, and the, the funny thing is, is that people were able to, uh, be more independent. Like, I think they were more free to chart their own course. So that's, has something to do with your brother, I think. Because today, people are very conforming. Weirdly, I think they are. I can kind of agree with that. Um... Because I, I, I graduated from high school in 1978, and then I went back to high school and graduated in 1987. And the people, my, my fellow students in the class of 87, were the children of people who grew up during the hippie era. And their parents, a lot of them seem to, be, to have never completely grown up, they, they, they didn't seem to be as responsible as, as the parents of the class of 1978. And so the kids, in a certain amount of backlash to the freedom of the 70s, were more responsible and conservative. So you're saying, you're saying that the parents from our age era were more, con were more traditional? Yeah, we and grew then, up with traditional And then parents. 10 years later, the kids were more hippie parent, yeah. the kids of hippie parents. So our parents grew up in the 50s mostly. Okay. But then nine, ten years later, the parents who grew up in the 60s, a lot of them didn't grow up completely. Right. They, they were all kind of divorced and, and, and just kind of maybe slightly more hedonistic than the parents of the 50s and the kids of the 80s became these just say no kids that were kind of, they were well, this is getting kind of diverted. What does this have to do with... Uh, well, just that my brother Dave. wanted more structure. At the same time, he was a wild man. He, he became this wild combination of things. He uh, became a Marine officer after graduating college at the University of New Mexico, where he had a lot of fun. He, he, you know, he, he did a lot of... Uh, dating and a lot of getting in fights and uh, was also a, a funny ass guy really quick on his feet and so he became a marine officer just about the time that we went over to fight Gulf War One in 1991 and he'd just gotten married we went to his wedding and because he was had just become a commissioned officer 
the way he took off, you know, like some people take off in a limo with cams tied on the back. He, he got a helicopter to pick up his wife and him to fly them off for their honeymoon. And uh, then he went off to war. And because he was newly married and he didn't want to leave his wife a widow, he chose to be in supply and procurement, in logistics. He, so he wasn't on the front lines. He was, um, you know, he was, he was you know, doing support services. And then his wife left him from an, about after, I don't know, a year, year and a half, for another woman. And he's like, well, shit, I could have been war fighting. And instead of doing something somewhat safer, and so he tried to, to switch to something else because now he was only you know, responsible for himself. And he ended up going, eventually getting into Intel. And, uh, but while he's doing this, he's working on other stuff. Um, he became an observant Jew, an orthodox, a strict Jew, keeping kosher, wearing the yarmulke all the time, and one, he liked conflict. He liked fucking with people. Not to be an asshole, just to, because he thought it was fun. I mean, yeah, he, he thought, he, he, he was pranky, and he, was, he liked uh, stirring up shit. So he liked the idea that if, he, if he's walking around as a Marine officer um, with a yarmulke on, that some redneck you know, from Alabama would be like, sir, what's that beanie on your head? And, and he'd be able to say, what are you calling a beanie? What are, you, what are you saying about a beanie on my head? He liked the idea that he would get into shit with people because of his Judaism. And at the same time, he was also becoming a stand-up comedian and a pretty good one. He did I don't know, probably close to 2,000 gigs which is what it takes. You have to do at least a thousand stand-up gigs to be, become good at being a stand-up. So the, here's a guy who's a Marine officer, and he went far. He became a lieutenant colonel by the time he was done, which is one rank. Well, it goes lieutenant colonel, colonel, then general. So he was only one or two steps below general. At the same time, he's a frickin' Orthodox Jew and a fucking stand-up comedian. It takes, I don't know, a certain kind of, uh, I don't know, to be sexist, balls to do all this shit. He fought in two wars. He fought in Gulf War I. He, was, he went over for Gulf War II. He went to Korea. Um, he worked at the Pentagon. He, he just retired from the Marines a month ago, and he was starting a new job at the Pentagon as a, working as an intel analyst for a civilian contractor. And he grew a big retirement beard, and I go, are you, you're going back to the Pentagon. And I go, are you going to uh, lose the beard? He goes, no, I'm going to make it huge. Because he, he was enjoying walking around the Pentagon where most people there are, are military and have to be super, you know, no beards, no facial hair, super tight haircuts, and he'd be walking around with this giant beard because he knew that it would, like, lead to you know, a certain amount of, of um, interesting interactions with people. Um, he would, when, you know, he would call up when he, would, when he was a you know, junior officer, he would call up uh, other junior officers and impersonate generals. This is General. Get this over, you know. Get Lieutenant Cahill over to my office immediately. Hmm. Lieutenant Cahill goes over to the general's office and says, "Yes, yes, you know," and and doesn't realize until he's over there that uh, he's been pranked. Hmm. Um, I I might owe, um, you know, most of my TV career to my brother Dave. He said that if he ever lived in L.A., and this is, he said this, I don't know, 25 years ago, um, in a time when, I mean, this shit wouldn't fly now, and it's not like he actually did it. He was, he was good at meeting women. Um, but he 
25 years ago, he said, if I ever lived in L live in L.A., I'm going to walk down the street and I'm going to ask every woman I meet if she wants to have sex with me. And I will get slapped a lot. But if just one woman in a hundred says yes, then it's worth it. And I thought, wow, that is a bit. I'm like, I'm borrowing it. So when it came time to submit bits to the pilot for The Man Show back in, I don't know, 1998 or something? I don't know. I submitted a bit called Ask 100 Women. Um, and I got hired for the pilot, my partner and I. And um, the, one of the hosts of the show actually went around. It was all a setup where, um, you know, where the women knew they were part of a, a bit, but the, the host went around and he asked just a bunch of women, you know, oh, you want to have sex? And he got slapped a lot. But I mean, it was a whole bit for the man show pilot. And, and based on that, you know, we got hired, my partner and I, um, who also had a bit based on what his brother, my partner had a bit that he sold to the pilot based on his brother when he took a dump, would face backwards on the toilet so he could use the tank as a desk. And <laughs> that became a bit called Manovations, Inventions for Manly Men, basically. And then based on, you know, we did well on the Man Show pilot, and then we um, worked... I'm just curious, when your brother asked the 100 women, did any of them say yes? He didn't really do it. He just said that he would, that's what he would do. Okay, because he never did move here. No, I mean, he lived here from time to time. Right. Um, but by the time he lived here, he wasn't going to pull that crap. Okay, all right. But he, I mean, he was, he was a friendly guy, and he, would, he, he was, and you and I know, we had to learn. Every guy has to, I mean, there are a bunch more rules to learn now that, that relations among between the sexes are a little bit more loaded. But one of the things that guys back, you know, 30, 40 years, to, to, to get a girlfriend, you have to learn to be able to approach women and then get rejected by women. If you can't learn that, unless you're some kind of super beautiful, awesome person, like, if you're a regular guy, you're not going to get a girlfriend, likely, unless you can frickin' have, have the gumption to go up and talk to him. Is that reasonable? Yeah. We got rejected all the time. Yeah. But you have to, if you fear rejection to the point where you can't talk to women, um, then you're just not going to get anywhere. Um, but he, he didn't have a problem with approaching people. He was, I mean, that was one of his great qualities. He thought Gloria already, he, he was, he was, Dave was politically conservative. Um, he was on Fox News as an expert or a commentator a few times. And he was about to be on Fox News a bunch um, because he couldn't do it that much when he was in the military because you can't be active. You know, so, you know, um, but now that he was retired from the Marines, he was going to you know, get a lot of gigs commentating. And he was much closer to you politically than to me. Uh, yeah. When um, Rick talks about his brother and giving him, you know, what what feelings do you get? What's what's your impression of Rick's brother? Oh well, I mean, you know, I I always admired him. I looked up to him. I mean, he was a uh, he was a patriot. Did you uh, know him? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. I I met him a few. Uh, few times we hung out a few a few times and he uh, I admired that he um, had become a, a marine and and had enthusiastically gone to war um, he was really looking forward to it he described um, waiting for the attack in Gulf War II and saying how all the Marines were really excited and wanting to fight. Um, 
and I remember think, thinking, well, what's, what is the significance of that story? Because they didn't actually come under fire. But, but then I realized, well, what kind of men are these that uh, are, are looking forward to engaging in combat? Uh, and so when he told me that, it didn't register because I just automatically thought, oh, well, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't actually fight. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. <laughs> if, if you're looking forward to fighting, that's a hell of, a, that's a hell of an outfit, uh, meaning that's a hell of a, a group of people um, that, they, that they were so, uh, I guess the word is gung-ho, no one was afraid, he said. They were all they were all ready to go, and and he was so proud of them because he could barely hold them back. Um, they were his uh, subordinates, and um, he he thought uh, I can say it now. I mean, he thought Obama was a Muslim, and uh, I I told him that. I did not think Obama was a Muslim, but I thought that he was doing everything that a Muslim would do if if he became president of the U.S. Um, that uh, to to make it possible for Iran to get a nuclear bomb, to abandon the Middle East to total chaos, um, to uh, Oh, shit, I didn't know this was going to turn into an Obama disc, but okay. Well, I, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to talk about your brother, um, he, uh, he was very much a, uh, a hater of the Democrats and was very highly motivated to uh, support the Republicans and Trump and uh, anybody that could stop uh, the Democrats weakening the United States. So, I mean, people don't just join the Marines because they're uh, patriotic. He actually felt um, his country was in danger from uh, enemies outside of the U.S. And, and the Democrats from within. Um, so even though we were politically opposite, um, we, we got along. Um, we developed a, a project together. It was mostly his idea. Um, it started off being called Albuquerque 2029. And the deal um, is, the con it, it's, it's, a, it's a high school, you know, it's a high school show, like 9210 was a high school show, or like Riverdale is a high school show, but set in the future. When we started pitching it like five years ago or even longer ago, so if we pitched it today, it would be like Albuquerque 2036, when um, today's teens are now the parents and the, and the, the clueless parents and technology is as advanced so fast that the, the, the people who are parental age really have not much of a clue. And it's the, it's the teens are the only ones who really can handle the technology of the 2030s. And uh, technology that's so powerful that if you don't know what you're doing, you, you may end up dead. Um, and we, we wrote a Bible, we wrote a whole first episode, we wrote the, you know, a Bible is the whole story arc across like five seasons where you, you develop the whole deal. There's, there's the, the one girl whose uh, her parents take her into a meeting with a lawyer and where they tell her that they are getting frozen, be getting put into, into cryonic suspension for five years so that they have a better chance of living longer into the future. They, they buy themselves five extra years now so that when they are awakened in the 2040s, 
medicine has advanced, and by sleeping for five years, being you know, corpsicles, um, they might gain 20 or 30 years on the other end, thanks to advances in medicine. And then it turns out that this is a scam on the part of uh, the mom and the lawyer, who's the mom's banging the lawyer, and it's only the dad who's going to be frozen. And then it turns out the lawyer is scamming both of them, and that, that he's not going to unfreeze the mom. Um, so he can steal the family's money. Um, and they're even freezing the frickin' dog, which, so the girl's gonna be left with nobody. Um, and then she finds out that it's all a lawyer's, the lawyer's scam, then she has to figure out how to, uh, she has to go from being a good girl to being a, a, a high-tech seductress. And this is just one character, and we had like six, eight characters. Who, oh, there was the kid who has to decide between being a natural athlete or a super modified athlete. Because at this point, in the, by the time we're in the 2030s, uh, uh, athletic technology, gen, gene manipulation and drugs and, and mechanical little doodads that are you know, like extra like chips that are added to your body. There's two different leagues, even at the high school level. There are the unmodified, it's like bodybuilding now. There are the there's the natural division for people who, with strict drug testing, you get as big as you can, but you can't do steroids. And then there's the, the bodybuilding where people aren't tested, and those guys are more... Mo anyway, this has moved into all sports. Natu the Nats versus the Mods. And that's just... And anyway, we developed this whole thing. We pitched it around. Um, it, Dave became, in his Marine career, he became a red team analyst. The red team, you might remember, you probably know, but under Jimmy Carter, um, uh, the Iranian fundamentalists, Islamic fundamentalists, took over the government and took the people, the Americans at the Iranian embassy, or at the American embassy in Tehran, the capital of Iran. They took, what, 60 Americans hostage, roughly? I, I, I don't know. 50, remember. 60, somewhere around there. And they were holding them under this, the Jimmy Carter administration, and Jimmy Carter okayed um, an operation to rescue the, the prisoners, because they'd been held prisoner for many months at this time. And they sent in helicopters, and the helicopters sucked up sand and their engines were disabled and one crashed, at least one crashed. Anyway, the helicopters was, were disabled. The, nobody was rescued. The rescuers themselves barely made it out of there and the, and, the, and the mission was a failure. And that was pretty much the end of the Carter presidency. It just, this operation, went, he would have been a superhero and he probably would have had two terms as president if this, if this operation had succeeded. Um, then looking at 9-11, and in fact, you became a conservative after 9-11. Yeah, I, I, uh, I would just like to say that if Carter had supported the Shah of Iran instead of abandoning him, we might not have had the resurgence of radical terrorism that we live with today. So just one more thing that the Democrats did to make our lives miserable and uh, more uh, vulnerable to attack from enemies. Um, well, but a red team analyst is somebody that works in the military as the uh, plays the part of the enemy. Uh, they try to analyze every plan and every operation and say what could the enemy do to make this not work out? But right? more broadly than that, what can go wrong? You've got this operation that's landing helicopters in, in a desert environment. So like a red, if they'd had a red team analyst, a bunch of red team guys analyzing that, they're like, all right, well, what if the helicopters can't deal with the, the, the weather or the terrain? Or what, what happens if, if we lose the helicopter? And what happens, it, the red team's job is to point out every possible thing that could go wrong. Um, 
And it, it's since 9-11, at, at least, it's been a bigger and bigger part um, of, of military analysis. You can't just plan for success. You have to plan for every possible freaking thing. Like, like the, the expedition to kill bin Laden, they lost a helicopter. I don't know what crashed it, but they, one of their helicopters was did, crashed on landing. Nobody was killed, but they were down to one helicopter, right? And they, lo they lost the helicopter in the uh, attempt to rescue the, the hostages in Iran. Well, the, they, they crashed into one another. Yeah, but this, they also lost a helicopter when they went to kill bin Laden. Okay. But they, that operation was a success because they, they somehow knew how to still pull it off even though they were down one helicopter. Mm -hmm. So I assume that, that the relative success, the, the success of the bin Laden operation versus the failure of the, of the Tehran hostage situation was probably at least partially due to red team analysis, trying to figure out what to do when things go wrong. Well, they, they had a... When they attacked Bin Laden, they had a model of the of the whole uh, area they built, and they actually built a like a town, I think, a fake town in the desert that they so they could see all the things that would go wrong. And they did that on the uh, when the Israelis raided Entebbe too, um, which was a famously successful raid. The 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 raid on the who took the hostages in Entebbe. The Palestinians. Palestinians the, took they, a whole they plane. Were German, uh, the the actual terrorists were a couple of Germans with Palestinian help, and uh, the the significance, I guess, to this story is that the Israelis had just done that really, really successfully. They had brilliantly saved Israeli hostages and uh, and escaped with only one death, the brother the, of Netanyahu. Yeah. The, the raid on Entebbe. They, they yeah. took the, the terrorists, Germans, Palestinians, they took a whole plane, they hijacked a whole plane, and they flew it to Uganda, which is a, a hellhole. In, so, in, it, it, it's not the best place, right? Well, what? All right, well, but still, freaking Uganda, like Idi Amin was dictator there. They don't, the, Idi Amin was a guy that was possibly a cannibal. He was, he was a was really a bad dictator. Of, of Uganda. Anyway, so it, it was a big contrast between well, these what, were, what the, the, if you want to talk about the raid, that's fine. Well, I'm just saying it was a huge success where they got in, they rescued 200-some hostages, and they only lost one, they lost zero hostages, and they only lost one of their own uh, rescuers. Yeah, who, who happened to be the brother of the current prime minister of Israel, Netanyahu. And that contrasted with the failure of the uh, Carter administration's attack uh, to save hostages in Iran. So it really made the U.S. look bad. And after that, I think the U.S. became more efficient, more aware of, you know, maybe... Kind of, but right. there was still 9-11, which was a, somewhat a, 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 fail, a U.S. failure of complacency. Can, can yeah. Sure. 